Hi, I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I usually teach the historical and ancient sociological context of Scripture, with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah, but not right now. Right now, I'm doing a series about how not to waste your time with bad study practices, bad resources, and just the general confusion that I faced when I started studying the Bible and was trying to figure out what to do and whose books I should read. Bottom line, I read a lot of nonsense and spent a ton of money on it. I'm going to give you some basics on how to avoid a lot of the pitfalls, save money, maximize your time and effort, and how to get the most out of what you are doing. The master book list can be found linked in the transcript, and I will keep adding to it as needed. Because I keep buying new books, right? The Bible is a library, and until we can really treat it as one, we will read it wrong and never be able to handle, you know, Never be able to sanely handle questions of authority, inerrancy, and inspiration. Fundamentalism is especially guilty of setting across-the-board standards for the Bible that apply absolutely unless it becomes inconvenient. And this has led to people falling away from the faith when they cannot reconcile verses that are at odds with one another, and there are many, with good reasons. Or finding themselves needing to support ideas such as humans thinking and feeling with their hard kidneys and bowels, or the concept of a flat earth supported by actual pillars, or one of the many material creation positions believers have come up with, um, with none really proving satisfactory. But when we understand the Bible as literature, we can release it from our modern rules that would have us treating the Bible in a way that's completely foreign and confusing to the original audience. I really ask you to be patient and bear with me if this is new information for you. I know how challenging it is. Remember that although everything in the Bible is for our benefit, none of it was written to our culture, in our language, or according to our rules of truth, accuracy, or intellectual conventions. All that fancy talk is just to state the plain truth that our ancestors changed the rules of communications long after the Bible was handed down, and it's ludicrous for us to hold them responsible for stuff that they had no reason to know, respect, or approve of. An example that a friend of mine brought to my memory this morning. When people ask why Abraham was treated with leniency for having married his sister in Leviticus, when Leviticus 18 clearly outlaws it, how do we respond? The same way we would in modern society, actually. Nothing is illegal until suddenly somebody decides to do something to make it illegal. The covenant of Sinai wasn't there in the garden, where they had no knowledge of evil, only exposure to that which is good. Or, you know, for Noah, or for Abraham, or in Egypt. We cannot retroactively hold someone accountable for doing something that was perfectly acceptable within that culture. Namely, practicing endogamous marriage. Marrying relatives, fellow clan members, and I'm not talking about the Ku Klux Klan, even if they might be more apt to... Never mind. You know, this was how ancient people consolidated resources. Family members were the only people who could really be trusted... Outsiders could be shamelessly lied to, and it was even considered honorable to do so. Not by God, of course, but by other people. Outsiders didn't deserve to be treated like insiders. That's something that Yahweh took steps to try and change later. This is why all the patriarchs married close relatives. It was normal within their culture. They would have looked at us marrying virtual strangers from questionable extended families, and and they would have been stunned. They would have thought we were really stupid, frankly. Marrying close family members wasn't a problem until God forbade it. And as far as we know, Abraham wasn't even close to knowing who God is when he and Sarah were first married. We know that Terah and Nahor were both idol worshippers, and so 
Likely Abraham and Sarah were as well. I would also point out that when the instruction was given at Sinai, there was absolutely no command to dissolve marriages that were already in existence when the law was given. Just as they were not held accountable for any idolatry or unclean eating or working on the Sabbath before the Exodus. It would have been unjust and cruel to do so, and that is not how Yahweh operates. In the same way, and back to the point, we now have modern rules for literature that we tend to filter the Bible through. We try to make historical narratives like Genesis into modern histories with accurate use of numbers and the numbers of generations in a genealogy, lifespans, and all the little factoids lining up with archaeology like an objective historian would be expected to today. We might look at polemical texts like Isaiah 44 and decide that they accurately represent the pagan mindset and lifestyle, not knowing that it is both a purposeful exaggeration and misrepresentation for the purpose of making their opponents look ridiculous. Or we might mistake the Genesis 1 temple text, which was also a polemic making fun of the pathetic gods of the nations for a how-to manual for creating a universe. Or, as I've mentioned before, we might hold the ancient listeners to modern scientific standards of inquiry and try to force God into being a science teacher when he was really just condescending to their level of knowledge so that he could be understood on the important stuff. We'll treat the Sinai Covenant like a Hellenistic law code instead of Ancient Near Eastern wisdom literature designed to help judges and kings make wise rulings when presented with difficult questions and unpleasant circumstances. But we'll talk about those individually later. Right now, I want to stress that the Bible isn't a book, but instead a library of 66 shorter works, most of which were initially given verbally in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek long before being committed to writing. They were given to different people, people who were not authors but receivers of revelation, which was then passed down through the generations by word of mouth, as, you know, we've been discussing over the last three weeks. This is why we have so many different tones, sounds, and moods and functionalities in Scripture, and why we can't just sit and read it through without paying attention to the intent, rhetoric, genre, and ancient rules of communication. We cannot read a psalm like a proverb, or the words of a prophet as we would a historical narrative. We have to look at whatever it is, and things can change even within a book. You know, Exodus is a terrific example of this. And say to ourselves, okay, is this poetry, or a wisdom saying, or a prophecy, or a narrative? Because it will change our our expectations and what we can honestly do with the text and what we can't do with the text. The story of the life of Abraham, for example, which I just began to teach to the kids on my other show, it has to be handled differently than Psalm 19, which is an ode to the Torah as a whole. Reading about Abraham... Sarah, and Lot is going to require me to take into account ancient Near Eastern law codes like Hammurabi, Lipit Ishtar, and others, as well as the context of the Nuzi tablets and the Amarna letters, as well as the wealth of knowledge from Ugarit. They will give me a decent picture of the background of their lives, just not a complete one. I will also benefit from a knowledge of geography. It will be important to know where Hermon, Betel, and the Negev were, as well as Ur, Egypt, and Haran. Agriculture, animal husbandry, and the flora and fauna are important. Ancestor worship and the very important concept of hospitality are indispensable. That's because this is a historical narrative. 
history presented in narrative form as a story and not just boring facts and figures. Understanding the way that the surrounding cultures told the life stories of their important ancestors will also help us to understand why they said this or that the way that they chose to. People in historical narratives are going to do what they do because their beliefs and understandings are different than ours. And unless we know what they knew or thought they knew, we can get the wrong idea. Like, for example, assuming that the sin of Sodom was homosexuality. When Ezekiel rightly points out that it was oppression, gang rape is not the same as homosexuality. Homosexuality is outlawed in Leviticus 18.22, but not in the Sodom account. Knowing how the ancient world looked at male-male sex relations changes the way we read that story. And I will not be teaching that to the kids. When we read the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we find ourselves colliding with the myths of the ancient Near Eastern world. And by myth, I define that as an origin story of something otherwise unexplainable to a pre-scientific culture. How does the sun travel across the sky? Well, obviously someone's either in a boat or chariot pulling it around. Why is the sky blue? Obviously there has to be a solid dome with water on top of it because sometimes it leaks through or, you know, someone opens a window. Myths helped ancient people try to understand something they couldn't explain and truly, you know, they really are quite clever. And God used these sorts of questions to teach the people in the wilderness about how different he is than the gods of the Egyptians and Babylonians. Why were we created? The people of the nation say we were created to be slaves to serve the gods. Genesis 1 gives us a God who worked for us to create an environment that gives us everything we need to survive and thrive. And one who has already blessed our fertility, so we don't need to go to a fertility deity for that. And he has rested here, taken up residence to reign over all the earth, so we don't have to think of him as distant and uncaring. Why did that terrible flood happen? The Babylonians say that their gods uh, did that because people were too annoying and they decided to kill them all just so they could get some sleep. Glad they didn't choose, you know, a frivolous reason. But Yahweh presents himself as a God who is only concerned with stopping sin and oppression. Why are there so many kinds of languages? Were different kinds of people really created by different kinds of gods? Yahweh instead tells them a story that is entirely unique in all the ancient world that all people are descended from the same people and place. And instead of a god who decided to just confuse the languages to be mean, like the Assyrian god Anki, Yahweh divided the languages in order to protect the people from getting in over their heads with being able to do too much too fast, according to Genesis 11. If we read these chapters like we read the stories of the patriarchs, we have problems and we will miss what Yahweh is teaching about how unique he is. The Psalms are some of the most brutally honest literature ever written by anyone, anywhere. In fact, they can be really cringeworthy sometimes. <laughs> the Psalms aren't all the same kind of literature either. It's a book of 150 songs. And they can be just as different as placing hip-hop next to rock and roll next to opera. Maybe not quite that different. Psalm 1, for example, is a song celebrating the blessings of obeying God. Psalm 7 has David begging God to kick his enemies' collective butts. Psalm 8 is just purely praising God with no strings attached. And there are many kinds of these psalms. Some were only sung when a new king had his coronation. Others were sung daily at the tabernacle or temple. Some psalms start out accusing God of neglecting the suffering and end up praising him for rescuing his people. One of the last ones says that anyone who smashes the heads of Babylonian babies against the rocks is like blessed. Dude, that is so messed up. The psalms are like that because they are honest. 
They're not supposed to be accurate. They aren't supposed to faithfully represent how God feels about things or about us. But they are the honest feelings of the people going to God in their times of trouble and triumph and sadness and joy. Sometimes they'll contain glimpses of the future like Psalm 22 or rebukes against idolaters like Psalm 115, but they are always brutally honest. Proverbs are wisdom sayings and they can be infuriating sometimes. Do we answer a fool according to his folly or not? The answer changes from verse to verse, and so neither piece of advice can be considered authoritative. And this is on purpose because with wisdom literature, the answer to most questions is, well, it depends. It depends on whether the fool you are confronted with is humble and just a well-meaning simpleton or a foolish, arrogant blowhard who won't listen no matter what you say. Correcting the former bears good fruit in their lives, as long as it's done in a loving and gracious way. But correcting the latter is like spitting into a strong wind. The prophets are often a smorgasbord of different genre and rhetorical types. Exhortation is huge in the prophetic books because exhortation was their number one job. Exhortation is a fancy word that means urging someone or a group to do or not do something. When the prophets told the people to give up their idols, to stop oppressing their neighbors, to trust God instead of going to the Egyptians for help, you know, etc., that wasn't just telling them what not to do, but encouraging them to cling, cleave, and to follow Yahweh exclusively. Sometimes prophets would speak of future events like the coming of the Messiah or an end to exile, or in terms of eschatology, you know, dealing with the end days, the world to come, the gathering of the nations, etc. Sometimes the prophets will speak in parables and allegories, and all of these different things have to be understood for what they are and what they are not. We really have to know what we can and can't make doctrine of, what was meant for doctrine building, and what was meant to make us think. In addition, we have to be very careful to identify what was for a specific audience and what is for us. The raising up of Cyrus to send the Jews home was for them. Isaiah 53, that was definitely for all the world because it describes the ministry of the suffering servant Yeshua. What about the first century teachings? The Hellenistic influence drastically changed the way that the Jews communicated ideas and how they lived, sometimes for the better and sometimes not. We see birth narratives, something almost unheard of in the ancient scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, We see them in Matthew and Luke. We see encomium, which are speeches that celebrate and promote an individual as worthy of honor. Yeshua, you may call him Jesus, takes the rare parable of the prophets and turns it into an art form. A third of his teachings are parables. He also speaks in allegories and in prophetic pronouncements of exhortation and prediction of the future. Teachings are something very Hellenistic and related to the workings of the philosophical schools of the Greco-Roman world. They emphasized following a teacher in order to become like that teacher and to be able to repeat his teachings. We see in the Gospels historical narratives again, but now within an entirely different world context. The science and beliefs about a lot of things have changed, and Yeshua is not just Moses Part 2. He's something completely unique and authoritative in his own right. Entirely unique to the first century teachings are the epistles, letters from apostles to various congregations and individuals. Although the Hebrew scriptures would sometimes briefly include a short letter within a larger book or story um, like Ezra, Nehemiah, or Daniel, we have people like Paul, Peter, James, and Jude writing longer treatises which actually teach people how to live out the day-to-day life of believers. 
in specifics, while living in a polytheistic, in imperial cult cities where the Aristotelian household codes are the law and slavery was a fact of life built into the culture of every empire on earth. Never before had long distance instruction been required on such a large scale, requiring correction and guidance to be given in writing, perhaps even before a single gospel account had been penned. These have to be read in ways that no other genre of scripture had been before, and we do violence to the word when we try to do otherwise. The last genre type that I will touch upon is the apocalypse, and we'll talk about this more in a, in a few, because this one needs its own, yeah. Uh, an apocalypse is a form of symbolic writing that cropped up during the intertestamental period and owes a lot to Persian and Hellenistic modes of thinking. An apocalypse was always written to a suffering community who was in danger either of compromise with empire or needed to be encouraged for standing firm in the truth against the powers that be. Angelic figures would pull aside the quote-unquote curtain that separates our world from the heavenly realms and the author would be shown how the battles they are facing looked from God's point of view where empires took the form of ravenous beasts and God's judgment was larger than life and his final victory assured and promised. Apocalypses were the propaganda literature of the ancient Jewish world and, as David De Silva, a noted Revelation scholar, points out, even a Roman official of moderate intelligence would know exactly what it was about and how badly Rome and the emperor and the imperial cult worship was being skewered because the symbolism, although confusing to us, was transparent to them. And I'm going to link a really great um, video presentation of his in the transcript. Added into all that, we have the art of hyperbole, which is exaggeration, poetics, puns, metaphors, courtroom dramas, the quoting of non-biblical writings and fiction, and all manner of rhetorical devices that made memorization easy and helped the ancient audience begin to grasp the nature and character of Yahweh, pitting him against and contrasting him with the gods of the nations. This was what it looked like when God chose to graciously and mercifully make himself known to his creation. He spoke to them in their language, according to their manner of communication, playing by their rhetorical rules and even accommodating their culture and belief in order to begin a conversation that would find its climax in Yeshua's life, ministry, death, and resurrection. And this showed us exactly who and what he is without the metaphors or accommodations. To see Yeshua is to see Yahweh. And I realize this can be really distressing, but I want to point out that you don't need much of this in order to read the Sermon on the Mount or Galatians 5 or 1 Corinthians 13 or 1 John to find out our obligation to love and sacrifice for each other. You don't need context to feed the poor or preach the good news or lead someone to salvation or to do any of the weightier matters of mercy and justice. Scholars aren't needful in the truly heavy lifting of the kingdom. However, scholars help the body to not create oppressive doctrines, hierarchies, or to misread scripture in ways that have led to genocide, enslavement, and all sorts of evils. Everyone has their place and we are all important. A person Hungry and cold on Skid Row doesn't give a flying fig for how to read Mark 13 in context. But this information is important for people who want to teach what things in the Bible mean. Very important. Context protects us and those with whom we interact so that we won't cherry pick and proof text in order to find what we can get away with doing to one another in ways that fall way short of love. Next week, we will talk about metaphors and what we should and should not do with them and what does and doesn't count as a metaphor and the purpose of metaphor in understanding God's nature and his generosity in communicating with us.